everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here for this talk on our recent uh, R package called Class DRM used for doing dose response modeling for high throughput data. So uh, first, some motivation for you. Uh, you have already seen some gene result picture on liver in the previous talk. So here, our motivation example that motivated us to do this uh, R package was also liver related uh, things. So uh, liver, as you would know, and you would see also in this picture and among all these uh, medications around it, is the main target of all the chemicals we take as medications because it's uh, the responsible organ to metabolize them. So all the toxic things which are in those chemicals will end up in the liver and so they could cause damages and induce damages to this organ and for your information the next organs that could get damaged are the kidney and the heart. So this uh, drug uh, induced injury and in particular drug induced liver injury which in short is called DILI is a really hot topic now among uh, especially pharmaceutical companies because not only it causes all these damages to their customers, it also costs a lot of money because many drugs are on the market after a lot of costs and then they have to go off the market because after a while they realize they uh, cause a lot of damages that cannot be accepted. So it is very important to, to understand and, and identify such uh, chemicals before and that of course, you would know all these chemicals are toxic, but the only difference is that where they become dangerous. So which dose, which amount of it that you would use and then that, that, make them, them, that make them dangerous. So of course, if you use very small doses of the chemicals, that would not be helpful because they would, not do no, they would do nothing. And if you use high doses, then they would be effective, but of course they could cause damages. So it is important to find that right dose. So this uh, dose matters. And our main goal is to be able to find such doses. For that, the data set that we had to work on was a data set uh, which was examined like, like 929 chemical compounds were examined in the context of high content screening uh, studies. So that's a, uh, that's a study that works with images. So we had used uh, one of the products of our company, Open Analytics, called Phaedra. So if you want more information, you can go to the website related to that. So this um, application can get all these data images and then give you back a lot of summaries and useful data which are good for statisticians or to do stuff with them among all those and responses for various responses. So there the target was the, was the liver. So I guess four types of responses were measured related to the liver, nuclear area, nuclear count and stuff like that, that I don't know much about them. So, uh, FEDRA itself would offer some of those response modeling, but there are usually some simple models that everybody would use or use, so that would face uh, the users with some challenges. First of all, because you had all these compounds here, if you had a few compounds, you would just look at the dose response relations and may, maybe for some of them you would see really, you do some tests, you would see no relation between the dose and the response, and then that makes no sense to, to fit a model and estimate something about the doses. So it is important, it was important to identify such, such compounds that the changing the dose would not affect their response. But also, these responses that we had to deal with were all kinds of shapes when coming with the dose. So they could be increasing, decreasing, or non-monotone. So for sure, for such various types of shapes, not a single model could be useful. So that also was a difficulty we had to deal with. And another thing was the computational issues, of course. So nonlinear models, too many compounds, how to do, how to do things fast. So here is just an example and also one line of comment. So this plot those response data is one function in our package that you can use to get a visualization, simple visualization of various uh, uh, data that you have in your whole, in your whole data set. So these five, uh, four compounds I've selected just for illustrations. You see the doses and how the compounds are changing. So you see they're not all the time monotone. A typical model which is used to analyze those response data is a logistic model. And the people doing uh, those responses stuff are really liking this model because it also has some nice, it, it came from some 
chemical, biological theories, so, but also it has nice properties. You see it has, it has four main parameters, that's why they all, it's also famous as like 4PL or PL4, four parameter logistic model. So you add these four parameters, an upper asymptote, a lower asymptote, a parameter determines how fast or slow you get from this upper asymptote to the lower one. So that's an important thing. And probably the most, that is this delta, they call it heel parameter or stiffness. This ED50 but is the main important parameter in this model. And to, in a very plain word, so this ED50 is the dose that would give you a response which is halfway between this lower and upper asymptote. Like here we had that hard, uh, zero and 10. In the middle, we had five, so we should see which dose would give that five. And that dose, they call it ED50, and it's a quite important quantity. It, it, it took me a while to, to understand how, how it is important, because if, the, if, if, it, if in a very low dose, so immediately you increase a little bit of the dose and the response already drops down, then that, that compound, that chemical is not that useful because you cannot use large doses of that, so probably you cannot see any any, any effect of that. To me, it's like, like using a red chili pepper, but also black pepper. So red chili pepper, if you add just a tiny bit more than what you have to add, already your food could be ruined, so it's, it's, it's not eatable anymore. But black pepper, you can add a bit more and nothing would change. So that's so like an ED50 for a black pepper is quite high, but for a chili, red chili, it's, it's quite low. So, and that's, you should be careful with those. Now, let's see how this model fits to our four examples. So you see, like, for these two, maybe, like here, the upper asymptote get, could not really be captured. For these two, actually, you couldn't even reach the lower asymptote. So, well, but that's how this model fits to our data. And these uh, vertical dashed red lines, you see these are the ED50s estimated. But, as I've said, not a single model would fit your to your data, but normally people just use this 4PL. So that's, that's the model which is normally 90% of the times used without a second doubt. But do we have other models? Sure we have. So if a statistician have one thing to offer to you all the time besides uncertainty, that's a model. So there are a lot of models available. A couple of them are here. So you see all these models fit to our data. So they fit differently sometimes. So still some points are out of the, the fitted line. We even included the linear model. The interesting thing is that all these vertical lines with these colors you see, these are all the ED50s. So different models are leading, leading to different ED50s. So, and that gets more interesting when we see normally scientists have thresholds. So they love thresholds. Every continuous variable should become categorical. And the threshold here, at, for example, in our example was those number at, at 10, 10 units of whatever it was. So anything lower than that can be considered as toxic and should not be used later on. Any compound with a ED50 larger than that can be used. So, well, uh, so you see, different models would, 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 would lead to different conclusions. But which model should we use? A typical way to select one model among many is using information criteria. So here you see a picture of the AI sees all these, all these different models. Well, to me, maybe only for compound number 17, which is a beta model, the AI see is a little bit small, more or smaller than the others, but for the rest, I'm not going to prefer one of these models to the other because of this tiny bit of difference in the AIC, because AIC is also something with uncertainty. So what to do? So shall we use only one of these models or not? That would bring us again to probably one of the most famous uh, quotes in statistics of George Box, that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And my interest here is in this word sum. So some of these models are useful and we have a whole literature in statistics to make use of these some useful models and that's called model averaging. So what model averaging is, done, is doing is to take advantage of all these good, all these some useful models. And on top of that, what it practically does it uh, that is that, that it takes into account a third source of uncertainty which is usually neglected. So we usually have these two sources of uncertainty. You are aware of that famous epsilon in all the statistical models and the uncertainty comes from the fact that the parameters in your model are estimated. But you see, 
uh, this uh, ED50, which is a single parameter estimated with different models leads to different estimates. So that's a variability among estimates of these parameters. So the model itself is a source of uncertainty. So when you consider a bunch of models instead of one, you are also taking into account that uncertainty. And then you estimate your parameter with all these uh, models, and then you take a weighted average of them. The weights depends on how well they feed. So I won't go into more details. Should you use all your models? No, this set of models uh, you should be using, this uh, model averaging should be really selected in an intelligent way. You should not feed a model to uh, where you should not feed. So if, if there is no relation between those and the response, the set of appropriate models is empty. So nothing should be done. If you know that the, the, the relation of those and response is monotone, then you should not include like a beta model which, 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 which allows non-monotonity. And that's what we try to incorporate in this CLOS theorem. So it um, consists of two main steps, CLOS, which is stands for clustering, and DRM, those response modeling. In the clustering step, in short, we try to cluster the those response relations based on their patterns. If they are flat, we are done, so we do nothing. If they are monotone or non-monotone, then the set of the models we use in our model averaging are different. How that's done? Well, we can talk about it later because we don't have much time. And then in the DRM step, we just fit all the models, get their estimates of ED50, get their uh, contribution to the weights, and then combine them and give back the, the final estimate. So just a bit of code. So we had two main functions to, to define this, uh, this pattern, to so do the clustering, general pattern clustering. You see an example here. And then uh, monotone pattern clustering. Monotone pattern clustering should be used where when you're sure that the relation between those and response is monotone. If you observe something non-monotone, that's, that's error, that's, that's wrong. So you should look for some monotone thing. And now you see the results for our four selected compounds. The first two are identified as flat. So you just put them away so you don't look at them. That means no matter which dose you use, it won't be toxic for this particular response. The two others, the pattern is defined something not monotone. So it says it goes down and then up with a minimum at two, so like that. The other one goes up and then down. So you see two, an EU shape, an umbrella shape, uh, designs are, are ident identified them. You have tested statistics, you had, okay. You have tested statistics, p-values, all the things you need. And then uh, it brings you to the feeding model step. So the DRM step, you have the function feed DRM. Again, you give your data, you can adjust the stuff. So you give the patterns identified from the other function. You can add even covariates which will be corrected uh, for, uh, cor for corrections uh, if, if you have some to correct for. And there is this um, parameter here because the problem here, it always goes compound by compound, so it's like embarrassingly parallel. So in all these functions, you have this n cores argument, uh, uh, argument that if you have more cores at hand, then, then you can allocate more power and then it will be faster. What you get as a result is the estimated ED50 for the, monotone pa for the compounds with the monotone patterns and non-monotone patterns, we had no, nothing monotone here, for the non-monotone ones obtained from different models, but also from a model averaging with the AIC weights and also with the best model, so the model with the smallest AIC. One interesting here, thing here is that if you had to use the typical logistic, you would get a nice ED50 uh, like 28, so that means no toxic, everything is fine. But model averaging gives you something close to zero, so the difference is really huge. So these things matter, and these are points to consider. So we have some more things to offer, just so fast. The simul eval DRM, so that simulation, eva simulation best evaluation of those response modeling. So sometimes you're interested to evaluate a setting for your, for your uh, a design for your study. How many doses should I use? How many replications per doses? So you give those settings to, to, to this function. It, gener it, it does simulation for you, how many times you want. Summarize your simulation results. Visualize them for you, like heat maps with different things. Mean square or, uh, uh, I don't know, bias, uh, relative bias. And then you can compare them. So if they're more to the blue, that setting is nicer. You have also a shiny app, because scientists don't like to, to code. So there are a simpler version of that, and also more complicated ones. You just give your data. Everything goes on in the background. So that's available also with the package. And uh, yes, so I'm on the conclusion slide. That comes with some news. OK. OK, 20 more minutes, seconds. <laughs> 
So we are now working, I, I hope you, you liked a bit of uh, what I've presented. So if you did, you may, uh, you may like to also keep an eye on CRAN for the, our new package, which would be there in a few months. We call it for now DRCMA, but maybe we change that. So that extends the class DRM in some ways. First, uh, class DRM now only works for balanced data. So if, if you have unbalanced, then you can analyze them also here. We, for now, we only, only use the models in the dose finding package, but in here, we're gonna add all the things in the DRC as well. Things will, will be done in a more intelligent way, more options for weightings are available. And one important thing is that if you have realized, we only give a point estimate of, your, of the ED50 in the current package. In the next one, we're gonna also give vari variabilities, variances, and confidence intervals, and also better graphics. Well, thank you. So you can get the package on the CRAN, and if you have more comments or questions, I'm at your service. Thank you for this nice, nice presentation. Uh, do we have questions? Hi, thank you. That was an excellent talk. I do a lot of um, dose response modeling and encountered everything that you mentioned. When you talk about non monotonic, how non monotonic do you mean? Because often there's a high dose hook effect that we see. Yeah. So, well, how, how does yeah. that work? I think uh, statistically talking, we can model any, any non-monotone pattern as well, but, but from a biological point of view, the most non-monotone pattern that they are interested in is an umbrella shape or a U shape. So it is almost monotone with exception of one point. So it goes up because there are some chemicals like that. So at the beginning they do nothing and suddenly they go up, but then they begin to come low. So the, these are the things that we consider for now. So, because that was of interest. So the, when we say monotone, that means, well, monotone with an exception. So with a maximum or a minimum. Okay, how is nesting or replicates, pseudo-replicates handled? You showed box plots in the beginning, so it, I assume you put everything together. Is there a way to find out uh, individual difference between replicates? Uh, they are, they are, indeed, they are all together. So, they are, they are, they are, so I think in the modeling stage, you are not considering that these replicates are for the same dose. You just treat them as independent observations. So, yeah. Um, I like ensemble methods and model averaging um, when it comes to create more stable results. Um, I do not like um, model averaging over models that are different, inherently different. So if there are two different models, more or less one is better than the other, and if you average, then you do not get the optimum, optimum model. So I would recommend to think about ways to um, rather make a decision between those models than to just make it into a big soup of things yeah, in order to really get the real point. Yeah. yeah. So that, that, that's what we are a little bit trying to do in this, in this new work, so to select these models. We still believe in, in most of the cases if you just use one model, especially for these dose response data, because normally there you don't have a large sample size and then anything could really fit somehow to this data and you will get some estimates which will you make decisions based on them. So it's good to consider a couple of different things, like not only log logistic, maybe a different in the same shape, but with tails different or something. But yeah, that is true. So you should not use just any any model. So I think it's also it also depends on on the on the people who are, who are gonna use these things. So they will see. Yeah, we 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 won't, we would not expect such a shape at all. So we won't use that model. But uh, yeah, selecting that indeed it should be in in, in an intelligent way. But yeah. So let's, uh, so no more question, I guess. Uh, so let's thank all the uh, speakers from the session and uh, yes.